So I'm going to uh, read uh, at least one of my favorite uh, Dr. Seuss books. Everybody is familiar with Dr. Seuss, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, it's called The uh, Lorax uh, by uh, Dr. Seuss. And if somebody cares a little bit about our environment, uh, this is a, a great book to read because it has a underlying story uh, that uh, Dr. Seuss tries to get across in this uh, in this book. So I'm going to begin, and then I'm going to try to go through it quickly, if you don't mind. Because how many have read this book? I thought a lot of you may have. So so we're going to be just going over it, and then after I get through. I want to talk to you about some of the things that I'm doing in Boston on the environment. And then I'll open it up for any questions that you have, okay? Yeah. All right, so this is the beginning of the book where this young boy is walking through uh, an area in the street of the lifted Lorax, it says. At the far end of town with purple grass rose and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted lords. And deep in the purple grass some people say if you look deep enough you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as he could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. This is an old house that's falling apart. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere? From the far end of town where the crippled grass rose, the old counselor still lives here. Ask him. He knows. So and then this is the Onslow's house. Everybody remembers the Onslow in the story? You won't see the ouncer. Don't knock on his door. He stays in his lurkin on the top of his door. He lurks in his lurkin cold uh, under the roof where he makes his own clothes out of the muffin roof. And on special day midnights in August he works, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tell us how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. And so this is the Onslow's house. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 50 cents and a nail. 15, excuse me, 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather's snail. There's a little boy tossing in uh, what he was requested to toss in to this uh, pail so the ounce would can take a look at it. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snuff, his secret strange hole in his ruffless glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper my phone. From the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. You can see him behind the boarded up windows and his uh, hands coming out. <coughs> and making a most careful count as to what he paid, what was paid to the ounce. And then here's the wisp of a home that has dropped down, slump, down slump the wisp of a home to your ear. And the old ounce's whispers are not very clear since 
they have no, uh, since they have to come down through the snurgly bows, and he sounds as if he had smallest bees on his nose. Now I tell you, he says, with a teeth sounding gray, how the ounce got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. And then he's going to explain it to uh, the young boy. And what a difference, right? When it started at the beginning, before all of the activities took place, and he's going to explain it to the young, uh, to the young man. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swami swans rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the trifula trees, the bright colored tops of the trifula trees, miles and miles in the fresh morning breeze. All the colors. And under the trees, I saw brown babaloots. It's like these little bears. These brown babaloots. Frisking about in their babaloo suits as they played in the shade of the trifula fruits. From the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming or splashing around. It's one thing about Dr. Seuss books, right? You can come up with your own Dr. Seuss dictionary because he comes up and makes up all of these words that you don't hear that often or you cannot uh, necessarily define unless you're talking about uh, Dr. Seuss a book. So there's the houseless wagon now. But those trees, those trees, those are the fool of trees. All my life I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of the tufts and much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what to do. I unloaded my cart. So the ostler saw all these trees, and he said, "Boy, I think I can, uh, I can do uh, uh, something here." And he unloaded his cart, in no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a tofula tree, just with one shot, and with great skill, full skill, and with great speedy speed. I took the soft truck and I knitted a me. <clears throat> you can see this little thing here is a, he calls it a me. <laughs> T, T H N E E D. It takes me a little while to try to pronounce that. <clears throat> The instant I finished, I heard a gazah. I looked, I saw something pop out of the stump of a tree I had chopped down. It was a shot man. The voice had described him. Well, that's hard. I don't know if I can, he also said. He was shottish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was Shoppish and bossy. That's how we describe. That's how we describe. Mister, he said, with a sawdusty sneeze, I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's the thing you're made out of this trifola truck? 
So the ostler is showing him what he made, and the Lorax is standing on the stump of this tree. Can you see him? Standing on the stump of this tree. And asking him, what did he make? And the ostler replies, look, Lorax, I said. There's no cause for alarm. I chopped down just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a steed. The theme of finding something that all people need. It's a shirt, it's a sock, it's a glove, it's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers, of bicycle seats. The Lord said to the ostler, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that full fleet. And here's the Lorax pointing to this that was made. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. But just at that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the steam I had admitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety-eight. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor, stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. Well, isn't that true? You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lord, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. That's what the house was said to the Lorax. I rushed across the room. And in no time at all, built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all the brothers and uncles and aunts, and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the Ostler family to get mighty rich, get over it here fast, take the road to North Ditch, turn left on where we can shop on right stitch. I think I pronounced one of those wrong. So here's the knee factory. Now all of the Ausler's family is there, and they're making all of these knees. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the Ausler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting knees, just as busy as bees, to the sound of the chopping of the Tapula trees. So you can see this beautiful area, if you remember, with all the trees up and then they chopping them all down, right? Then one, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe packer, which whacked off four Trifula trees at one smacker. We were making things four times as fast as before, and the Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. So here's all the trees coming down all at once as they're packing away and taking all the trees down and making these then one day, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks to the trees, which you seem to be chopping down as fast as you please. And, uh, but I also speak, uh, I'm also in charge of the brown babaloots who play in the shade in their babaloo suits and happily live eating Trifula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough Trifula fruit to go around. And my poor Babaloots are all getting crummies. 
because they have gas and no food in their tummies. And so here's the brown babalutes that the Lorax is speaking uh, about. And he's worried about the impact on the other species uh, that were out there uh, because of what had taken place. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food. And I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Ansla, felt sad as I watched them all go, but business is business and business must grow, regardless of crummies in my tummy, you know. So that's what the Ansla said, and all the Babalutes are leaving. I meant no harm, most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger and bigger I got. I figured my factory, I figured my roads, I figured my wagons, and I figured the loads of the thieves I shipped out. I was shipping them north and south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on figuring, selling more thieves, and I figured my money, which everyone needs. And you can see, now he has this massive factory where he's building all of, doing all of these needs and selling them. And he's doing very well, the onslaught. Then again, the onslaught came back. I was fixing some pipes when the old nuisance Lorax came back. I had the Lorax, he caught and he went he seen, he uh, sneezed and he snuffled. He snuffled and sniffed. Onslaught, he cried with a curious croak. Onslaught, you're making such smokeless smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. So now the air in this area, because of the factory, is all smog. And these swami swamps, I guess you call them, uh, are here. And how can they survive with smog in their throat? And so, said the Lord, please pardon my cough. They can't live here. So I'm sending them on. Where will they go? Said the, said the Asa, I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape the smog you smog, smogged up around here, the Lorax said. And then the Lorax came inside and pointed out the waste product that the Asa was making and he said, what's more, snappy answer, uh, the, the Lorax, his dander was up. Let me say a few words about this glumpity glump. Your machinery plugs on day and night without stop making glumpity glump, also sloppity slop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old ounce of you. So all of this glumpity glump was part of the factory. And where was it going? Your glumpity glump. Your glumpy the pond where the humming fish hum. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gun gum. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. Uh, they'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. So he was dumping all of the waste product in the pond where the fish were. And that is impacting the environment in a negative way. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I 
yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yappity yap and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'll tell you. I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering. Turning more to fool of trees into needs which everybody, everyone, everyone needs. So that's what the ounceler said to the Lorax. And at, the, at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside of the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last Trifula tree of them all. So he cut down all the trees. Because he was not thinking sustainably, how would his business continue to grow if he wasn't continuing to plant behind the trees he was taking down, right? And it was the very last Trifula tree of them all. No more trees, well, no more sneeze. No more work to be done. So in no time, my uncle and aunts and everyone all waved me goodbye. They jumped into the cars and drove away under the smog of smog, uh, uh, smogging stars. Now all, I can't see this. Now all that was left Beneath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Loris and I. There was big factory, smog everywhere, all of his family leaving because there were no more trees. Just him and the empty factory and the Lorax were there. The Lawrence had nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad and backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants, and I'll, I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the swamp without leaving a trace. So there goes the Lorax, who picked himself up and left the area. And all the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. U-N-L-E-S-S, -S, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess, the Oswald was saying to the little boy. He really, over these years, he was wondering what the Oswald, what the, what the Lorax meant when he left this behind. And the officer said to the boy, that was a long, long time ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart, I worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the officer, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you hears a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Unless somebody like you hears a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch. So here's the counselor up in his lurk. He 
see his hand coming up, he's throwing something down to the little boy. And what he's throwing down is very important. He throws down to the little boy. So catch calls the counselor. He lets something fall. It's a trapula seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the tefrula seeds, and tefrula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new tefrula, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. And so that is the story of the listed Lorax. And uh, <clears throat> and I love the how many people like to draw? And 
and carbon dioxide, which we exhale, actually helps to uh, provide light for our planet, uh, our trees, our flowers, etc., that uh, take place. But when that balance is off between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, that's what really uh, is dangerous for our planet as a, as a whole. And we're already starting to experience that. Um, and so we need to be defenders of our planet or she will start to defend herself from all of us. And that's what is starting to happen. We're starting to see it with extreme weather events that are occurring uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're starting to see it with extreme heat uh, that is taking place in parts of the world. Uh, the melting of the polar cap and, 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 and places around the world uh, like Greenland and others, um, it, is, uh, it is getting scary. And so we need to stop putting in place policies to protect our existing generation, but also very much importantly to protect your generation. So I am one of 40 senators that are elected to represent you in the Massachusetts Senate. And I've had the great honor of being in the Senate since 1993. Uh, I served in the House of Representatives prior to that, was elected in uh, 1988, uh, started serving in 89. Uh, there. So I served for four years in the House, and this is my 28th year in the Senate. So 32 years in the legislature. And I now am the Dean of the Massachusetts Senate. So I'm the longest continuously serving Senator in uh, the Massachusetts Senate. And that's in large part because I'm uh, honored to have received uh, the support of uh, families here in the town of Rainham, but throughout my whole district. And so I want to thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to serve you. And I uh, ran originally for the seat because I cared a lot about and still do uh, care about making a difference in our society. I think one of the key things we need to focus on, which we just passed this past year, is the uh, Student Opportunity Act Education, Public Education. Because without the resources that go into K through 12 education, and then higher education, then you don't get the opportunity to uh, be able to compete and win in a 21st century society. Uh, you do that uh, when you have an equal opportunity to learn all the things you need to learn so that you can uh, continue to educate yourself. Because when you're in school, you're learning a little bit as to how to learn. But uh, it's a lifelong learning process. School is only part of it. You can continue to teach yourself all kinds of things when you have learned how to learn. And so uh, that's what you're doing with your teachers uh, right now, and I'm sure at home. And I thank them very much. I, I think one of the toughest jobs in America today is that of a teacher. So be a little kinder to your teachers, okay? <laughs> because it is a challenging job. Uh, for them because they're trying to take responsibility um, and uh, 
have the responsibility for you uh, while you're in their care here, but also they're trying to worry about you as you leave school, and there are all kinds of challenges that you're learning about today uh, in school. So let me stop there. We have, uh, we have 40 members of the Senate that I serve with, and then there are 160 members of the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. You add those both together, and you get 200 members of the legislature, okay? So that's what, uh, what I'm part of is the Massachusetts legislature. I serve in the Senate. I served for two years. And then I have to go back out to the voters and ask them to allow me to come back and uh, to serve again for another two years. So my terms, people talk, talk about term limits, but terms are limited to two years at a time. And then you have to go back out and ask permission to serve for another two years. So I've been doing that for uh, several years now. And, and that's what I do. And then the governor uh, is elected statewide with other constitutional offices. And we passed a bill, for example, the Student Opportunity Act in Massachusetts, passed the House of Representatives and the Senate, went to the governor, the governor signed the bill, and that's how the laws are made. Sometimes they're a little bit more complicated than that, but the governor may not do it, right? And the governor could veto the bill and send it back to the legislature. Then it would take two-thirds vote of the legislature in the House and in the Senate to override the governor's veto so a piece of legislation will become law. So let me stop there and say that I grew up in Taunton, not too far from here. I went to uh, schools just like you were doing, and I never thought I would be an elected member of the legislature. It was something that happened because I ended up being frustrated with something that was happening with the local school committee in Taunton. And I decided to run for office. I was playing in a band at the time. Yeah, I played in a band. I played saxophone and clarinet. And I sang with them with a small group, three-piece group. And we played weddings and showers and universities and public functions. Uh, and so a lot of people had got to know me because of performing at a number of different local functions. And so they gave me a shot of running for school board. And I ran and got elected to the school board and found out that I really liked making a difference uh, for people. I'd have parents call me about concerns about their children in school. And we try to work with them on different issues. And I liked it so much, I served on the school board for 10 years and became chair of the board. And then I worked for the mayor of Taunton at the same time, being the chief of staff, where I went back to school and got my undergraduate degree and then my master's degree in public administration. And then ran for the Massachusetts legislature. And so here I am. So any questions that you may have of me? Well, so anything to do with the, the, the story or the environment or just the legislature in general or something you may be curious about, I'll be pleased to try to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, what's your name? Emily, that's my mother's name. Have I ever met Donald Trump? I have not met Donald Trump. I have, I have not uh, eager to do so, I must say. I have never met him, no. Yes. 
I would, uh, at this point in time, I would never run for, tr for president, no. Uh, it would be very, very, very difficult to do so. It's a very challenging position to be able to be successful. But I want to say something here, and I hope everybody will pay attention to this. You work. What's your first name? Leo. 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 Well, I don't know if we've had a president Leo. I don't think we've had a president Leo. But Leo, you could. Anybody here that wanted to, and I mean anybody here that wanted to, if you really study, if you paid attention, if you prepared yourself for it, we have the type of society here in America where anybody could rise up eventually to become uh, president of the United States. In some places in the world, that is not the case. People wouldn't be able to do that. I have run for Congress before, years ago, and I almost ran again this year, but I decided well, I actually, uh, my wife decided <laughs> that that wasn't going to happen. So, uh, so I decided not to do that and uh, decided to run again for the uh, for the Massachusetts Senate later on later on this year. Yes, what's your first name? What is it? Mike Bloomberg. Have I met Mike Bloomberg? I think I have met Mike Bloomberg, but a long, a long time ago, I met I met him at a uh, an event. Uh, I think I met him at an event place. It was either New York or Washington, but that was years and years ago. Uh, but I, I don't. If he wouldn't remember it. I don't. You know, I just about remember it. I forgot exactly what kind of a event it was. Uh, I do appreciate all the work that he has done on the environment because he's done a lot of work on the, on the environment. Okay. Don't get it done. You get the slogan down, huh? Okay. Yes. Have I met a president before? Yes. I have uh, actually flown in the Air Force One. Uh, I have. Uh, I was very close, still am. I know, I know both uh, President uh, Bill Clinton and uh, and, and uh, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton. I know them uh, fairly well, and I'll tell you a story, and it's an amazing story uh, that when you ask if somebody can run for president. I was in Washington, D.C., and I read that President Clinton was going to be coming to Boston uh, for uh, a Democratic fundraiser. And so I called the White House and left a message that I was in Washington, he was in Washington, obviously, and I had to be coming back to Boston because that's where I would come back to, right? They'd come back on it. And uh, I said, seeing as though we were going in the same direction, wouldn't it be nice if I could uh, have an opportunity to get uh, uh, on Air Force One and fly back with them? And don't you know, I received a call uh, and said to meet him at uh, Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, to meet him in a, in a plane, and I was able to fly back on Air Force One. Uh, and these were the people that were on the trip. That were, it was President Clinton, it was former Secretary of State and United States Senator John Kerry, former U.S. Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, and Congressman Governor. We were all on the flight back from Washington, D.C. to Boston together. And I thought to myself, is this, uh, my, my background is, uh, my, my family background is Portuguese American. So, um, and we, we would, I grew up in a little village area in Taunton called the Portuguese Village. A lot of the families were. Portuguese American backgrounds in that section. And School Street in 
Tawny. And I says, he is this uh, uh, kid from the Portuguese village in Tawny uh, getting a ride on Air Force One with the President of the United States, a nominee for President of the party, uh, and the brother of a president uh, coming back to Boston, Massachusetts. And that's why, Leo, I said, anything is possible. If you work hard, if you get involved, if you pay attention, anything is possible. I would have never thought when I was your age that that would have ever been possible for me to experience. And it was a possibility only because uh, I had become involved and I got involved with community activities and I got involved with state activities and national activities. And that's all up to you as to how much you want to get involved, how much you want to study. But if you do your part, the teachers are doing their part, right? They're trying to explain things to you and you have to do your part. Uh, and if you do that to share responsibility, then you have the opportunity to actually be the president of Toy Air Force One someday if you want to. Or be a teacher and change lives, hundreds of lives every, every day. You get to make a difference in, in society. Uh, so these are very, very important jobs when you're working on behalf of people. All right? One other thing. Uh, coronavirus, right? Everybody knows the, uh, everybody knows, uh, you want to stand up for a second? What's your name? Allie, you want to stand up? You want to do this with me? Do this, do this. It's the corona bump right here, right? We don't have to necessarily shake hands, right? We can just do the corona bump, that's it.
So that's my message to you. Please, let's treat each other with respect. Uh, respect another person's point of view. Even if you totally disagree with them, <clears throat> try to listen to what they have to say. There might be something else they're saying that you're not hearing uh, from them. I think it's important to, uh, to listen uh, very well to them. And I think we're done, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I wish I could take other questions. If you have other questions for me, I, I, yes, I know her. And I know Joe, I know Joe Biden, who, who's, who's running for president, the vice, the former vice president, and uh, <coughs> most of the other people that are running. Are but anyway, if you, if you have other questions for me, I'm just going to leave you with this. If you do it through your class, if you want to write me a question, I will try to get, or if you want to contact me, you can write to my office in Boston, and, you, and the, and the uh, teachers will have that address. You send me something, and I will get back to you, I promise. Okay, thank you.